No TV show is perfect. With the sheer number of moving parts that go into any series, it's simply not possible for everything to go totally smoothly on even the greatest show. But sometimes there's one issue above all others that just riles the audience up. And like a dog with a bone, they can't let go of it until the showrunners agree to fix it. Hopefully, anyway. So, with that in mind, I'm Ellie with What Culture, here with 10 TV shows that need to ditch one thing. Number 10. The Skewed Aspect Ratio in The Sandman Netflix's The Sandman was widely praised for faithfully adapting Neil Gaiman's legendary comic book to the small screen, and as great as it was, for the first half of the series anyway, many took issue with a bizarre stylistic choice throughout. For many of the show's more surreal sequences, the aspect ratio was skewed, with the image being compressed to make any character on screen look weirdly elongated. Though some viewers initially assumed this was a technical error on Netflix's part, Variety reported that it was indeed an intentional stylistic choice, to give the more heightened scenes a uniquely otherworldly, disconcerting feel. But considering that many found it to be more of a distraction than a transporting stylistic conceit, the filmmakers might be best advised to ditch it, or at least severely scale back its use for the second season, which is expected to shoot this summer. Number 9. Helmet Master Chief in Halo The first season of Paramount's Halo series was a wildly mixed bag, and above all the complaints about its leaden storytelling and uneven production values, there's one issue that reigns supreme – Master Chief himself. Though Pablo Schreiber gives a typically solid performance as Chief, the show commits the egregious sin of having the hero repeatedly remove his helmet, despite him almost never doing this in the video games. While some might argue that this was a practical decision to help give the audience a tangible emotional connection to Chief through his face, it's an argument that feels considerably less persuasive in a post-Mandalorian world. Even though Chief doesn't have a creed-based rule for keeping the helmet on, it's nevertheless a defining aspect of the character, and showing us so much of the human face underneath does detract somewhat from the faithfulness of his depiction. Number 8. Plot Armor for the Main Characters in The Boys The Boys is one of the most irreverent TV shows on the air right now, but for all of its glorious ultra-violence and satire of the superhero genre, it also has one major problem – plot armor. Most of the show's central characters have felt protected from any major harm since its first season, enough that it's tough for audiences to buy into any tangible threat being posed to, say, Huey, Billy Butcher, or Starlight. It feels rather like like the show's writers have written themselves into a corner by presenting Homelander as so unstoppably powerful. Why hasn't he just taken one of his many opportunities to kill off the heroes? Homelander really has nothing to lose at this point, and beyond that, the show just seems afraid to pull the trigger on killing characters who really should be dead. Season 4 desperately needs to deliver some major deaths and remind audiences that, yes, the central characters are in actual peril. Number 7. The Absent Infected in The Last of Us HBO's The Last of Us is without question the greatest video game adaptation of all time. But many fans decried the general absence of the infected throughout the show. Joel and Ellie only occasionally come across clickers, with the focus being far more intently on their relationship during their harrowing journey. After all, given that the infected are such a huge, pervasive part of the games, for them to take such a backseat in Season 1 was always going to prove divisive. But in a recent interview with Variety, the show's co-creator Craig Mazin acknowledged the complaints and hinted that Season 2 will likely feature far more infected. He said, It's quite possible that there will be a lot more infected later, and perhaps different kinds. Given that The Last of Us Part 2 is a considerably more intense experience than its predecessor, Giving the infected a far greater presence would certainly make a lot of sense. Number 6. Time Jumps in House of the Dragon HBO's Game of Thrones prequel, House of the Dragon, was largely well-received by critics and fans alike. It wasn't entirely free of criticisms, though, with some finding the show's use of time jumps excessive. Throughout the first 10 episode season, four time jumps take place, two massive, two small, totaling around 16 years, which many found jarring and caused the season to feel rushed. While we know that the central cast is now set and won't be going anywhere anytime soon, many fans are hoping that season 2 and beyond will chill out with the time skips and simply focus on the drama at hand. 
This does thankfully appear to be on the cards, as last year's showrunner Ryan Condal promised fans that there would be no more substantial time jumps. He said, As a reward to our wonderful audience for following us through all the time jumps and recasts, they are done. We tell the story in real time from here forward. The actors are playing these characters until the end. We're not recasting anybody. We're not making any huge jumps forward in time. We are now in the Dance of the Dragons and we're gonna tell that story. Number 5. Chucky's Bad Lip Sync in Chucky Sci-Fi's Chucky series is an absolute gift, a riotous continuation of the Child's Play franchise which perhaps proves that the killer doll was best suited for episodic storytelling all along. As great as the show is, however, it's certainly not perfect, having clearly been produced on a modest budget which has resulted in a number of effects-based compromises. Chucky is depicted in the series through a combination of animatronics and child doubles, and it's not unfair to say that the animatronic puppetry is a major step down from most of the Child's Play movies. In the TV show, Chucky has lost a considerable amount of his animated qualities, and when he speaks, the mouth movements aren't even close to matching the words most most of the time. At the end of the day, it's hardly a deal breaker. The show still rules and its depiction of Chucky is plenty entertaining, but given the series' success on sci-fi, it'd sure be great to see a little more money poured into the practical effects for the upcoming third season. Number 4. The Brutal Episode Lengths in Stranger Things Though Stranger Things' fourth season was largely well received by critics and fans alike, there was one persistent criticism. The episodes were just too damn long. The shortest episode in the season was 64 minutes long, and the longest was an eye-watering 150, while most of the season's nine episodes clocked in at around 75 to 80 minutes. As great as the show is, this was very obviously a case of too much of a good thing, as many found these expanded runtimes bloated and overindulgent. Clearly, Netflix gave the Duffer Brothers carte blanche to do whatever they wanted, and they chose to turn season 4 into a 13-hour endurance trial. But for the upcoming fifth and final season, the Duffers would do well to calm things down a bit and return to the more concise, modest storytelling canvas of the three prior seasons. Thankfully, this does seem to be the case, as in an interview with The Hollywood Reporter last summer, the Duffers suggested season 5's runtimes would be less extreme. They said, We're trying to return to the simplicity of the structure in season 1, with bigger scale and scope, except for the finale, which I'm expecting will be pretty massive. Number 3. All the Young Adult Melodrama in Wednesday the Addams Family spin-off series Wednesday has been a stonking ratings hit for Netflix, no matter that it received relatively mixed reviews for its decision to sanitise the franchise's gothic style into a more teen-friendly young adult template. Despite Jenna Ortega's superb performance as the title character, far too much of the show's eight episodes was dominated by CW caliber teen melodrama, pertaining to both a hilariously predictable central mystery and grown-worthy love triangle plot. It's clear that Wednesday's first season was crafted less for fans of the 1990s Adams Family movies and more for teens who can't get enough of Riverdale. The satirical subversiveness of the films was swapped out for a bizarrely by-the-numbers treatment aimed directly at Gen Z's lowest common denominator. Even Ortega herself has admitted that the first season's writing had its issues, and so hopefully season 2 might flip the balance of young adult drama and gothic gallows humour. Then again, considering how phenomenally successful season 1 was regardless, Netflix may opt for an if-it-ain't-broke-don't-fix-it approach, which would be most disappointing. Number 2. Elizabeth Moss's Close-Ups in The Handmaid's Tale the Handmaid's Tale is a TV show that benefits enormously from Elizabeth Moss's phenomenal performance as Offred slash June, and surely the film's most notable stylistic trait is the pervasive use of extreme close-ups of Moss's face in basically every single episode. Though the close-ups certainly put audiences right in the trenches with June for a season or two, by the time the show's third season premiered, the extensive use of close-ups had basically reached the level of self-parody. Check any social media platform and you'll find hundreds of posts complaining about the excessive number of close-ups, that what was initially a sparingly deployed tactic to evoke a certain mood has been rendered unintentionally comical through its overuse. With the show's sixth and final season currently in production, we can only hope that they finally listen to the increasingly vocal fans and dial the close-ups back. Number 1. Mystery Box Storytelling in The Lord of the Rings – The Rings of Power 
Though The Lord of the Rings The Rings of Power was decently received by critics, the fan response proved considerably more mixed, with criticism being levelled against the dialogue, pacing, deviations from Tolkien's lore, and perhaps worst of all, the over-reliance on mystery box storytelling. The mystery box is a term popularised by J.J. Abrams during production of his hit TV show Lost, which featured a large cast of characters revolving around a series of interconnecting mysteries, the answers to which were slow bled over over the course of a season, or even multiple seasons. Many have complained that The Rings of Power feels too enslaved to this method of storytelling, by establishing so many mysteries in its first season, some of which still remain up in the air, rather than simply focusing on telling a compelling narrative in its own right. Ultimately, Tolkien's world is mesmerising enough that The Rings of Power really doesn't need this focus on big water cooler mysteries. It just needs well-drawn characters and an intriguing central conflict. We can only hope that season 2 might chill out with inundating the audience with dramatic enigmas and just, you know, tell a good story. And that concludes our list. If you think we missed any, then do let us know in the comments below. And while you're there, don't forget to like and subscribe and tap that notification bell. Also, head over to Twitter and follow us there, and I can be found across various social medias just by searching Ellie Little Child. I've been Ellie with What Culture. I hope you have a magical day, and I'll see you real soon.